It's still unclear what happens. She gets like yeeted away by yeah. the monsters yeah. and then some force yeets her back. I guess yeah. Zeus was like, no, 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 you can't die here. You gotta die over here. Now you're a tree. Austin, Texas, what is good? It is a delight to be here for my first ever Austin live show. Got a packed house here, and this is very fun. Thank you very much, I'm happy to be here. Let's, uh, I guess let's keep things weird, as we say, right? <laughs> so, we, in the spirit of keeping things weird, uh, are going to be discussing... <sighs> A, mo a movie <laughs> that is certainly, they made it, right? They made it, they finished it, they put it out into theaters and it does exist. And it's a lot. And we will be getting into the beginning portion of it, which like isn't that terrible. So I've done you all a favor and that you're gonna get like some fun bits, but some confusing stuff. But in order to properly break down this feet of cinema, we need to have some guests because I'm never on this journey alone. So let's bring up our first of two guests who is representing the people who have read the book and seen the movie category. Please welcome to the stage someone who you probably all love more than me, which I think makes sense. And I agree with you all. It's Kelly Schubert. <laughs> Hello. How's it going? Good. As you can see, we went very Christmassy. Yes, we did. <laughs> I'm finally busting out Panta Claus on stage with the one red and one green leg. <laughs> and the yep. uh, ugly Christmas sweater that I got the year before that became a mm -hmm. capitalism adventure. Yep. I didn't buy the sweater for Christmas, but I went to put it on just for a regular day and Mike said you can't wear that if it's not Christmas. So now it is my Christmas sweater. I don't sweater. know if I explicitly said that. I, I think you were I like, is it a Christmas it. party? And I was yeah. like, no. And you're like, hmm. <laughs> so I was like, okay. That sounds I'll change my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> but now we get to finally wear it because we're yes. doing a live show in December. Here <laughs> exactly. we are. Exactly. Now it's not just Kelly here on the stage. We have someone who didn't who had seen them before, but unfortunately I made this person watch these movies again for prep, but we're gonna have a fun time, so it'll all be worth it. Someone that I have done many podcasting things with in the past on some other shows, and I'm very excited to have them making their TNO debut. Please make some noise for Michael Harley. <laughs> money all over this stage. <laughs> and it's all real. It's totally real. <laughs> take some home. Don't do it. I have every time, when people take them, I have to buy more fake money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real. It is not worth much. But speaking of things that are not worth much, let's talk about the Sea of Monsters movie. <laughs> Before we get into it, though, let's lay the groundwork of your Percy Jackson fandom or lack thereof. Everyone knows Kelly's deal, but what about you, Michael? Uh, <laughs> you hadn't read them, you've seen the movies, what's the history? Oh God, your audience is gonna boo me. No! Okay. <laughs> I started in your shoes and they're all here, so it's okay. So, I was deep in Harry Potter, deep in Harry Potter. Yeah, it's okay, you don't have to woo. Uh, <laughs> but I tried reading the first book, and I think because I was so indoctrinated, I read it, I read Percy Jackson, and I was like, this is too similar to Harry Potter for me. But I said that about everything because I was a little snooty snoot. Um, so I didn't, I, I couldn't get past it. Then, uh, so my brother has autism, and he, back in the day, we went to, he got to pick the movie, and we went to a movie every weekend. So that is the only reason I saw these two movies. Um, because he didn't know what he was picking. Um, and so I saw the movies, thought they were terrible, knew from what everybody was telling me that they were not a proper reflection of the book, so I didn't take it that way. Tried to read the first book again, thinking this will be better. And then it was still that thing where Percy was like, oh, my mom died, but summer camp. And I was like, I can't do this. Um, so 
I promise I will read them before I see the new TV series. But um, it's kind of lucky I didn't because I'm your control for this. Yes. Because I haven't read the books. Mm -hmm. And so those movies... Just I was watching them as a movie viewer with a film degree going, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the right qualifications. Yes. And you're going to do the perfect thing. We're recording this on December 15th. So you can do this, read the book, watch the show. You'll be good to go. Yes, you're I just on the fast track to not having to worry about this. I work in libraries, so I can grab that book very quickly. <laughs> perfect. So... Kelly and I had seen the movie once before. Yes. I watched it for the stream that we did on Patreon. Kelly, because we had too many people in our apartment <laughs> to fit Kelly on the couch, yeah. Kelly watched it and then the stream from our bedroom yeah. just on yeah. the other side. I mean, it was great. I got to lay down while I watched it and eat <laughs> snacks and they had to you sit there on camera. I was just laying, eating blue Sour Punch straws in bed watching mm. it. And did, did you yeah, stay yeah. awake for the entire thing? <laughs> I, um, I I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is, I fell asleep for about 10 minutes. And as the movie goes, it's actually pretty fun and the pretty interesting. It's got some fun stuff happening. For the first half. And then about the time right before it turns, I fell asleep for about 10 minutes and I woke up and everything was wrong. <laughs> and I was just like, is it the same movie? What's happening? I and didn't so, fall asleep and I was wondering if it was the same movie. Yeah, it just, yeah. it falls off. <laughs> So there's a there's a 10 minute gap in my knowledge, but I don't think we're going to get to that today. No, but let's see how much so that we can get through. So we open the film with this underwater opening to let you know that it's still Percy Jackson and this one's the Sea of Monsters. <laughs> we do see in the opening credits that it's not just a 1492 production, Chris Columbus's wonderfully named production <laughs> company, but it's also Sunswept Films, who I don't know anything about. I don't know if you know anything about them, but I just thought it was interesting that it's no longer just a Chris Columbus only. Thank God Sunswept <laughs> Films is here to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> now, what they do and what I've heard about this film is that they were trying to distance themselves from their own previous movie that they made. <laughs> they were trying to market this as like, A, we fixed it, and B, it's a standalone. You don't even have to worry about seeing the first one. It's totally fine. Trust us. It's good now. So in keeping with that, they have this very simple, in case you missed the first movie or haven't read the books thing, where Percy narrating during the title screen before mm -hmm. the title shows up, he's like, sometimes gods have kids with humans and they're called demigods and I'm one of them and my dad's Poseidon and he's the son of the sea. And then the title's like, Percy Jackson, Sea of Monsters. <laughs> and it is interesting that it's just called, like the official title is just Percy Jackson colon Sea of Monsters. So the first one was Percy Jackson and the Olympians colon the lightning thief. Huh. And then the book is Percy Jackson and the Olympians, the sea of monsters. But this is just Percy Jackson colon sea of monsters. Interesting. It's just one of those things. Why? I, I guess because they were like, well, the title of the first one, that was the problem. Too many words. <laughs> we don't need articles. <laughs> we don't need to care about the gods. Just Percy, ocean, let's go. <laughs> so... Title screen shows up. And what's interesting about Sea of Monsters, the way that it's written, is that they've decided to like Greek it up, but they've also forgotten which characters are Greek characters. Like they just <laughs> opened up that symbols thing on Microsoft Word and they were like, that looks like an E, yeah. And they just use all of them. And yeah. they even use different ones. So in Percy Jackson Sea of Monsters, the E in Percy is just like a normal capital E, but the bottom one goes up at an angle a little bit, so it's fun. But then the E in C is like... Uh, it's almost like the the euro symbol almost, or it's just like a curvy thing with like two lines going through it. And then the E in monsters is a sigma, which is not an E, <laughs> but they add another line in the middle because they were like, well, this thing that's not an E doesn't look like an E enough. So let's add a horizontal line oh into gosh. the middle part. So it's just nothing based off a letter that's not an E. And that's Sea of Monsters. Like, it's just, oh my God, the choices. Three different E's in one title. Right. You've seen multiple fonts on one poster, yeah. but have you ever seen three <laughs> different E's in one phrase? I think I was still gathering my snacks at this time because I don't remember any of this. <laughs> yeah. I did not catch any of that. I unfortunately caught everything. <laughs> but I was alerted to when we were watching it because Emily from Monster Donut, who's a big 
Greek classical literature buff. She was like, what is happening? <laughs> she, immediately the sirens went off for her. So then we get the Thalia flashback to start it. And Thalia, I guess you know a little bit now. It's tough because when we did this for the first movie, we had my buddy Adam is the person who hadn't read the books. And we kept being like, okay, so in the book, it was like this and blah, blah, blah. This is so different yeah. that we won't get into the movie if I start trying to describe the book because yeah. it's just so laughably different. But the Thalia backstory is a thing. They like mostly get what is important about setting the scene of it right. But as far as the scene itself, you just see these young kids running away from vague monsters. A full tree just gets chucked at them. <laughs> <laughs> they they yeah. do pronounce Thalia's name wrong. They call her, the kids call her Talia. And then in the movie, they start calling her Talia. Mm. There's lots of disagreements about how to say the name, but Rick, the guy who wrote it, says Thalia, so I go with that. <laughs> so they're doing that. The one thing that I do love, little 10-year-old or however old she's gonna be because they changed the ages in the movie, mm -hmm. little Thalia has a cool leather jacket on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here for it, that's yeah. her vibe. She's very <laughs> punk rock, My Chemical Romance, hot topic energy in the books, mm -hmm. so they've captured that. As somebody who didn't read the books, the and I watched them back to back last night. That was my first day of my yeah. Weekend. I gave you lots of notice. Um, <laughs> you did not have to do that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, compared to the opening scene of Lightning Thief, where it's just two adults in coats just being like, <laughs> 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 and you're like, what? what are they talking about? And then to, to compared to that, like this was a little more engaging. Like mm -hmm. I and, and, and honestly, too, the kids. I mean, they were selling it for what it was worth. So I was kind of like, man, these kids should have been the main actors for this movie. Because yeah. I think they're they're actually closer to the age of the kids than yeah. they're supposed to be. Yeah, right. They and, are. and before this thing starts, Percy says something like, seven years ago. Yeah. And then they show the scene. Because I guess in this movie, like in the previous one, they were 16. So they're all supposed to be 17. No, in the previous now. one, they were like 28. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. They were supposed to be 16, <laughs> yeah. which in the books, like they're all supposed to become 16 by the end of the book. And that's yeah. a very important plot the end of the point. series. End of the series. End yes. of the series. They're yes. all supposed to be like 11 at this point. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. End of the series, it's like turning 16's a big deal. But yeah. then Chris so they're 75. Like, yeah. By yeah. This point. <laughs> Just, uh -huh. It's all weird. But yeah, the kids were kind of fun, but they end up trying to go into camp. And then it's this weird thing because in the first movie, they don't have any of the Thalia tree stuff. It's established in the first book that you have the barrier. And in the first movie, the barrier is still kind of there. They just but have it to get a little bit. Yeah, they like they have to get through the arch in the first movie, but they never really say the Thalia thing. So then these kids are running and they're like, we have to get into camp. And the assumption would be because there's a barrier to keep us safe, like they're running for the arch. And then Thalia, you know, dies and Zeus treeifies her and then you get the weird finger yeah, root thing. Yeah. Uh, didn't, didn't, like didn't love it. She like, like dies, dies yeah. too. Uh -huh. yeah. but I, when, she, when she hit the ground, I was like, oh, she's fine. This is a kid's movie. Oh no, she did. <laughs> <laughs> it's still unclear what happens. She gets like yeeted away by yeah. the monsters yeah. and then some force yeets her back. I guess yeah. Zeus was like, no, 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 you can't die here. You got to die over here. Now you're a tree. <laughs> <laughs> but what's weird is like, they are running for what appears to be a safe zone, but then Thalia makes a new safe zone, and then this narrator Percy is like, and now the camp is safe. It's like, well, if there wasn't that barrier before, why were they running to camp? Yeah. Like, what was that gonna do? They were just gonna like get on the other side of the arch and be like, base, and then the monsters, <laughs> <laughs> the monsters will be like, no. <laughs> Maybe they were assuming that if they got to camp, there'd be help there for them. Well, based on Mr. D and Chiron doing nothing yeah. during the Colchis bullfight soon, I don't know that that was gonna happen. That's a great point. No one was gonna come and help them. He was like, what's going on? Oh, what's this tree? Did you plant something? <laughs> So anyway, the double yeet happens, she becomes a tree, and then we flash forward into the future, and we have Percy and the rest of Camp Half-Blood finding themselves in an episode of Most Extreme Elimination Challenge, <laughs> slash Wipeout, if you're too young, and they're on this big thing, and of course, because this movie came out in, what, 2013, we have to have Fall Out Boy in their new thing, oh where they're God. like, what if we were in football commercials and, <laughs> and TV shows? We don't make punk rock music anymore, we make things that get us royalty money, and it's the, light them up, up, up. <laughs> song, <laughs> fine. So they're doing all this thing. It's, it is like kind of a cool structure, but it is just 
so confusing when you try to think yeah. of why they're doing it. Yeah. Can, can you two work on selling Camp Half Blood to me? Because that place looks like it sucks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as, as a gay man who does not have very fond memories of camp, <laughs> From my younger years, why would I want to go there? Because I I hate all the Hogwarts stuff now, but I would still rather go there than Camp Half Blood <laughs> because I will bruise like a peach if I go there. <laughs> the book version of Camp Half Blood, it's supposed to be a safe haven. It's basically as you are becoming older, more monsters recognize that you're a demigod, so there's some monsters attacking. That's not a problem I'll have, but <laughs> <laughs> you go to camp and then it's a place where you are kept safe. And then also the people at camp teach you important life skills to stay alive. And they also teach you what's going on with the world around you. They explain a little bit, depending on how important you are to the plot, uh, they do it in different ways. But they explain to you what's going on with the Greek stuff of it all. Then they teach you, here's how you sword fight. Here's how you use bows and arrows. Here's how you, you know, rock climb and mm-hmm. canoe and swim. And Are there like houses? Yes. Or, like teams? So, oh, right. Yeah, they don't They don't talk about any of this in the oh, movie. I forgot. Wow. They've a corp- Is there candy? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but there are, instead of houses, there are cabins. And each cabin is supposed to be for one of the people on Mount Olympus, one of the gods or goddesses. And you go first to the Hermes cabin because Hermes is the god of travelers before you get claimed by your godly parent. And then you would get put into the Hephaestus one and then they would teach you more things about working in the forge or the Demeter one. And they're like, here's how you plant things and stuff like that. (laughs) But all you get in the first movie is like, your dad really liked you, Percy. Here's a house. And they don't don't (laughs) explain that there are other cabins for all of the kids that become your, you know, siblings, friends, etc. I think this version of the Wipeout games is supposed to be like reflective of these sometimes in the camp do competitions like chariot yeah. races or capture the flag or things to, I guess they did capture the flag in the first one, right? Yeah. But it yeah. was just war. Yeah, <laughs> but just it was just war. The crap they out played of each other. games to hone their fighting skills and to kind of have some fun, friendly competition. I think that's what this was supposed to be. Yes, that's what they're trying to do. And then the conversation after they talk about it. So like it is the sort of thing that kind of happens at camp. There is also like a lava rock wall that this, I guess, was like trying to do. But anyway, they're trying to get the ring at the top to win the thing for fun. You know, I guess they're trying to mix (laughs) like important survival skills with a little bit of fun. That's why they do capture the flag Mm -hmm. and things like that. Okay. Now, well, at this point, I can't think of any fantasy that sounds very appealing in my 30 some (laughs) years. So I'll just live in this awful, awful reality (laughs) we have. (laughs) So then someone runs in and at first I was like, is Thalia okay? Uh, But it turns out that it's Clarice who exists now. She was very important (laughs) in the first book but they decided not to put her in the first movie and just take all of her personality traits and put them into Annabeth in the first movie. Mm -hmm. Because Clarice is like the bully that Percy has to struggle against and that's how he realizes his powers is because he's fighting against Clarice. But they just kind of give that to Annabeth instead in the first movie. But then now they've extracted her into Clarice, a new person, and they've also accidentally taken out the part where Annabeth and Percy are supposed to be in love with each other because Clarice and Percy have infinitely more chemistry. Yes. <laughs> yes. So much more. Yeah. Yep. They've unfortunately left Annabeth with zero personality as well. And it was like she had none in the first movie and they're yeah. like, wow, they could remove some. Like, yeah. There's just nothing yeah. left. Yeah. Her only personality in the first one was you're supposed to be my love interest mm-hmm. and I'm also supposed to be the bully. Right. Now... She's nothing. She's just <laughs> She's nothing, nothing except for, as we find out, maybe a little bit racist. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. They've deleted everything and added in a sprinkle of racism <laughs> yeah. instead. It's really it's bad. It's weird. Well, yeah. And Clarice is so, she's so Malfoy-esque. Like, yeah. She's a lazy mm-hmm. bully. I love how she's like, <laughs> what did you do? Save the world? <laughs> well, I got to the top of this tower. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sure, you saved the world, but you only did it once. Yeah. I won four competitions that don't matter. Yeah. Like, cool. I won at camp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my trophies. So her and Percy taunt each other. And in this like one brief exchange, just infinitely more chemistry between the two of them, we do see Annabeth, who is blonde now. <laughs> that was another thing where like, it seems like they were trying to do so many things it was just the the worst course correction possible. Where the first movie, they were like, 
we don't care about the fans. We're going to make a movie. And then the second one was like, oh, no, let's just do as much fan pandering and that'll fix everything. Right. So they're like, Annabeth, we'll give her blonde ish hair and gray color contacts. And now Annabeth is fine. Right, guys? Because <laughs> that's how she's supposed to look. She's like, whatever, it doesn't matter. But like, apparently that was going to fix everything. So she's cheering on Percy. Grover is also cheering on Percy, but that's because he's bet 50 drachma on him, which in the universe of Percy Jackson, drachma is kind of like John Wick coins. If you've ever seen those movies, no, yeah. right. <laughs> it's more, it's less like a currency and more like a transactional thing. It's not necessarily like everything is equal, but it's like, if you've done something to help me, here's a drachma. So, you know, one drachma for a particular exchange, cool. So to bet 50 of them is yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> that is like retirement money. Yeah. <laughs> like you can do so much. So him betting that is absurd. And then what's great about this movie, you get little hints of it being very 2013 because in the background, you see a lot of people with foam fingers and then you also see people with vuvuzelas <laughs> because <laughs> that World Cup had just happened, I guess. Yeah. So that's happening. And then we get a very fun introduction. We get finally to meet Mr. D who runs the camp Notably, not in the first film. <laughs> and it was played by Stanley Tucci, which makes me very happy as a big Tucci head. <laughs> but it was also funny because in earlier episodes of The New Olympian, when I was just going through the books, I was like, you know who'd make a great Hades? Because Hades, who's in the first movie, just wildly different. But book Hades is like very sassy and more like Hercules Hades, where he's just kind of like snarky and he's more like a disgruntled stepfather that's running a company who hates his employees. And I was like, Tucci would be great. <laughs> and then Tucci does show up, but as Mr. D, and I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. Instantly, Tucci, phenomenal. He's, He's so great. Very good. He's so good yeah. in this movie. He's fantastic. He's there. We have a new Chiron. Yeah, Chiron. I noticed. No longer, <laughs> <laughs> no longer Pierce Brosnan, but I guess they're like, well, he has to be British because we established him as British. Maybe everyone will forget. And the whole time we were watching this movie on the patron stream, I kept being like, who is this guy? You were guy? thinking Why? the same thing I was like, thinking. I know this guy. I can't figure it out. And then so much was happening, I couldn't think about it. So then I Googled it this time. It's Rupert from Ted Lasso. <laughs> Anthony Head, like wild, wild just to see someone who I've only previously seen in Ted Lasso, someone that I want to murder every second he's on screen. I think retroactively <laughs> though, like, Watching it now to see him there, I was just like, oh, a familiar face, thank God. <laughs> and somebody who can act. And yeah. like, it was weird with the Pierce Brosnan and Anthony Head switch because yeah. I was like, yeah, the similarities are uncanny. <laughs> and just, they were just like British. The hair's long enough. You, yeah. <laughs> That's Put fine. You're looking at the horse end anyway, <laughs> so they'll never notice. <laughs> but what's weird talking about the horse end, I'd, I'd have to do like a side by side screen comparison. Chiron is way smaller in this movie, right? Like the oh, horse yeah. portion of Chiron is significantly smaller. Interesting. Or maybe it's just because I am very fresh off of watching the first two episodes of the new Percy Jackson TV show, because I got to go to the premiere. Bizarre, <laughs> bizarre, bizarre. They make him quite large and appropriately horse-sized. Yep. The horse portion of Chiron in this movie, far too small. He looks like a pony. Yes, or yeah. like a mule. Like yeah. it's just not <laughs> big enough. And there's a scene later where I see why they did it. When they run to the tree later on, you can just see he just walks. Yeah. And you pointed this out, but backstage mm. that Grover also just walks. Yeah. Or did you point it out? Uh, one in the did. car, it was, yeah. Yeah, like Grover just walks. But then they just play. walks and then there's horse legs behind him. I think right. they made him smaller just so that they could be like, yeah, the front legs are just the same height and then the CGI is less work. Right. It's wild coming. This was the era of like, the unfinished YA adaptations. We have so many like lost souls from the 2000s <laughs> and 2010s. And coming off of Narnia, mm -hmm. which did that really well. Oh, the Tumnus? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. They, like they did it pretty convincingly mm -hmm. and then the, and set that example and then Sea of Monsters and Lightning Thief were like, let's not do that mm -hmm. <laughs> because we're tired. Yeah. yeah. And like the results are just really rocky. Yeah. I didn't no, notice right? it the first time that I watched it, but like you were saying, being fresh off, off of watching the first two episodes, they do a better job of it, of making Chiron look like somebody who has a horse half and making Grover look like somebody who has a goat half. And it became extremely obvious watching it the second time around that this person is just walking and then there's CGI over his legs. Yeah. It's, well, they, they all their budget on Stanley Tucci. Yeah. <laughs> Correct decision. Correct decision. So we see Mr. D 
as Stanley Tucci. <laughs> we see Stanley Tucci as Mr. D <laughs> doing the thing. And, and in the books, it's the thing that they kind of get into, but basically he's cursed. He has to be in charge of the camp and he also can't drink alcohol. So he tries to pour wine into a glass and it turns into water. And Mr. D has a great thing where he says, you know, the Christians have a guy that can do this in reverse. Now that's a God. <laughs> it's a good line. It's, it's a, a good, good line. It's a good line. But what it made me think of was during the Harry Potter era, there were some very conservative Christian groups that got mad at Harry Potter for being a fantasy world that still exists on Earth that then you know, they never explicitly said if God existed or not. The kids and they did didn't... get Christmas and Easter break, though. I know. And so, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I feel like this movie was trying to be like, we're saying he can exist in this world. Please don't I, yeah. get mad at us. Yeah. And I feel like that was thrown. I mean, it's a good joke, but it mm -hmm. felt, as soon as they said it, I was like, oh, they're trying not to get in trouble for being a fantasy world. I think it's intentional. And it mm -hmm. is also something, I don't want to spoil the first two episodes, but like yep. a joke like this gets played in one of the first two episodes of the Disney Plus show. Mm -hmm. So I think it is like an intentional thing where they're like, we got to make sure that people who yeah. decide that you can't read a book that teaches you good life values, we can't have right. our children reading that because, oh no, the fiction book doesn't yeah. open the possibility of Jesus Christ existing. Right. And I'm just like, it's a it's a fantasy world. I think you're allowed to read fantasy if you're Christian. But I think the issue that they have with it is that it's happening on Earth and it's close enough to Earth and therefore we must clarify God can exist in this universe too. Yeah. So they, yeah, they definitely threw it in to to avoid the, the Harry Potter mm -hmm. far right Christian groups getting mad at them. Yeah, but... It's a good joke. So then <laughs> we see the competition continuing and we see some very swole horned guy. <laughs> I don't think they even show you his bottom half to let you know that he's a satyr. So at first I was like, rip dude with horns. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm not supposed to know who you are, right? And then we meet him later. Not a person in the book at all. Just completely made up. And then there's a kid trying to win this challenge who is struggling. He gets dragged around by a ladder because this whole thing is spinning him in circles. And then Percy has to go save him, I guess, because he's a hero. And this kid's name is Tereus, not someone in the books at all, just our old pal Tereus, who we've known and loved forever. And Percy does these impossible gravity moves to go save him. But I think what's strange is that if we had an actual book, Percy Jackson, he would have just looked down and been like, oh, sucks to be him. And he would not <laughs> have saved him at all. There's no <laughs> world in which Percy does this. Like, yep. he's going to win the competition and then go down and maybe try to help this guy. Yeah. I think that's why the movies are so frustrating for somebody who hasn't read the books to, like, get on board with Percy as a character because they don't know who he is. And from what I understand... Percy is a little more belligerent and sassy in the books. Yeah, and, he's... and he does, but he doesn't have he doesn't have any personality really in the movies, no. other than he's Logan Lerman and he's nice. Yeah, and <laughs> I so there like because the, the first movie his introduction is so fast mm -hmm. and it's like he has an abusive stepfather and he can't read and that's all you know about him. <laughs> yeah. But you don't know anything about his like character or mm -hmm. what he would do as a person. So this is them kind of retconning. Well, he's a nice person, by the way, this guy that you've been following who's the hero of our story. He has morals. Um, and, <laughs> and, and so it's like there's a, there's a kind of attempt to give him character here. So I semi appreciated it, yeah. but then... He'll he'll undo it in just a few minutes when we meet Tyson. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll get back to that. It, it's tough. It also shows though that he is not a smart character because <laughs> he's about two seconds away from pulling this ring out, which right. is going to stop yeah. the thing from spinning. Correct. So he's like, "Oh no, dude, spinning! I won, and you're safe." But he's like, "Oh no." I must be self-sacrificing too. Let me go. <laughs> it's oh, it made me so mad. <laughs> Pretty frustrating. It's I think it's going on with the theme of they recognize things they didn't establish in the first movie. So they're mm -hmm. like, we gotta make sure we put it in the second. We're like, we didn't show that Percy is a nice person. <laughs> Let's make sure <laughs> we get that established as soon as we can. Let's have them do this Tower of Doom. So Clarice wins. She taunts Percy that his first quest must have been beginner's luck. And then Annabeth, who is out of breath for some reason. <laughs> yeah stands up to Percy. He's like cheering so loudly for him. <laughs> he was saving. He was saving the world. <laughs> Come on. And then Grover, after Clarice leaves, is about to call her the B word, yeah. which is like, what are, what are we doing? That's yeah. unnecessary. Annabeth cuts him off. Percy then begins to agree with 
Clarice's taunt saying, oh, I don't know, you know, I've only done that one thing. But Grover says, no way. You recovered Ares' stolen chariot. The wildest thing about this little throwaway line is that it is a reference to the like spinoff, not necessary to the story, but still helps with the story, like companion book mm-hmm. that came out between books four and five. Yep. They're like, this is how we get the fans on board, a reference to the demigod files. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's exactly like in Cursed Child, how they constantly reference stuff from Pottermore to be like, we did our research. Isn't it great <laughs> that you're just hearing this character spew nonsense that has nothing to do with the plot? <laughs> it sounds like it's kind of the same. Yeah, like, it's just like we, we any nugget we can throw in mm-hmm, to try to make mm-hmm. the fans do Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at TV. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just I understood so, that reference. It's just so weird that it's like, wait, we're in book two and you're talking about book 4.5 things? But Percy says, no, it was Clarice who did that. And then Grover lists off some other competitions, mm-hmm. assuming these like pointless just camp things, then references the Bronze Dragon's Quest, which is like a butchering of a different part of the Demigod Files, because yeah. the Bronze yeah. Dragon didn't have a quest, but the Bronze Dragon was in it. So now the Demigod Files is like really established as canon in the Sea of Monsters movie. <laughs> and then Annabeth is just, I'm sure Alexandra Daddario, I'm not sure. She might be a nice person. She's not a good actress. She's just like. It's okay. She got a, she got an Emmy nomination for White Lotus. She's okay, fine. Good. She's fine. <laughs> She's you don't have to offer her. She's fine. <laughs> but she tries to do this thing where Grover's like listing the things and she tries to do the like, you know, move your hand over your neck to get him to stop motion. And it's just this like, she's standing a millimeter from Percy and is like, Hah! Yeah, like, <laughs> as if Percy's not going to be like, what are you doing? <laughs> wild. Absolutely wild. But Annabeth tries to stand up for Percy, saying, I'd lick a pair of cloven hooves before I let you listen to Clarice instead of us. No offense, Grover. And Grover says, none taken. Is that an offer? Uh, can, yeah. can, can we talk about Grover for a minute? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I... I know that Grover in the films is not what he is in the book at all from, but I don't know what he's like in the book. Just, but. you know that thing, like you can do that shortcut on your computer where it takes the colors and makes it an inverted color? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think on my Mac, I want to say it's like control option command eight. Don't quote me on it. <laughs> Or F8, one of the, anyway, if you do that, that's Grover. Just okay. like the complete opposite. <laughs> like when you change uh, Super Smash Brothers from Link to Dark Link, <laughs> just like do that <laughs> in reverse. You're like, oh, a nice person who's not mean to anyone. Grover. Because poor Brandon T. Jackson, he's. No, don't, not poor. He's he's weird and homophobic. Oh, okay. <laughs> don't well, worry never about mind. It. Yeah, it Well, never sucks. mind then. Yeah. <laughs> Because he's, uh, I will say he's trying with what he has, but I, I, they gave him awful material. Mm -hmm. And just every time a line comes out of his mouth, I'm like, you guys are in high school. Don't say things like that. (laughs) Like it's, and I mean, they are probably things high schoolers would say, but at the same time, just some of the things that he says, and then that particular Mm -hmm. line, I was kind of hoping they would dull that down from Lightning Thief, but they kind of ramped it up instead. What's funny is because I covered the, emails that Uncle Rick wrote to the production staff of The Lightning Thief, he had this whole thing where he's like, this movie's too crude, you gotta take out these foul jokes, all this kind of stuff. And it seems like for the most part they did. Like there's some stuff in The Lightning Thief movie, but not that much. It felt like this movie could have used another email. Because we're five minutes in and we've already got Grover trying to call Mm -hmm. Clarice the B word and then weird sexual feet licking (laughs) stuff. Like, I don't know, like not kink shaming, but like it's supposed to be a kid's movie. Like, (laughs) I don't know, man. So then Mr. D comes up and he calls Percy Jackson, Perry Johnson, classic Mr. D trope of always getting everybody's name wrong. And then he asks Percy to do a task and he gives him a thing that looks like a spear and then it turns into a rake, which is like kind of fine. But like also, why is Percy the one person to clean it up? It's not like he lost or did Mm -hmm. something rude, but I don't get why he gets singled out to rake, but he does. And then he has to sadly rake as the crane shot (laughs) moves away. So Percy goes to the shores of Vancouver, even though this is supposed to be Long Island, to talk to his dad. Because Percy's main motivating factor in this movie is imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's why. So I noticed that a lot of the very prestigious adult actors who were playing the Greek gods didn't show up for this movie. No. (laughs) And and I I was wondering, could you explain to me, is he talking to his to the water because (laughs) they didn't have enough to pay anybody to play his dad who would be (laughs) recognizable or did they, does he 
Does he always talk to the water? I think it's a two <laughs> birds, one stone approach. It is a thing in the books that like you, it is a struggle for them to ever get the chance to talk to their godly parents. But also I think they didn't have to pay Grey's Anatomy guy, Grey's Anatomy money <laughs> <laughs> to be in the movie. Yeah. So I think it yeah. was a two bird, one stone kind of Because they really thoroughly established at the end of the first movie that his dad was like, I really do care about you yeah. and I want to see you succeed. And then the next movie, he is a full on absentee dad. Right. And yep. I was yeah. shocked, especially too, because of what, when we introduced Tyson, like, I really want to get Tyson. Yeah, we'll get, yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> It also helps with his one motivating factor of imposter syndrome that his dad won't talk to him. Yeah. But yeah. But it is weird that it's like, oh, Percy saved the world. And now I won't talk to him yeah. every couple yeah. of minutes <laughs> like I do in the first movie mm -hmm. when I give him advice like, Percy, do this. Yeah. I so. do think this was around peak Grey's Anatomy time. Yeah. 2013. When maybe. Owen Hunt would have been coming oh, on the Sean, show. Sean, no. Well, that's so that's the problem. It's more expensive to get. Exactly. Dr. And that's why he's. Oh, yes. He's not here. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. We are in agreement. He's busy being. Owen oh, Hunt. yeah. Sean does in full Shonda mode at this point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so then we cut to a first person view of someone looking at Chiron and Mr. D trying to figure out how this chap waltzed into camp. And Chiron, who this is the point of my notes, who's too small to be a horse, thinks that this person must be a god spawn since he made it through the barrier. And this first person camera character, very obviously Tyson, knows that his dad is Poseidon. And in theory, shouldn't Dionysus and Chiron know this too? Like, shouldn't they know how Cyclops biology works? It's weird yeah. that Tyson knows even that, like they've made Tyson a weird thing where like Tyson is supposed to be just very like young and naive in the books. He's supposed to be like if Percy had a younger brother who like didn't know better and didn't have social cues and that kind of makes Percy embarrassed at first and then he learns to love him and Tyson just is a wonderful ball of joy. Tyson weirdly like knows too much but then also doesn't know some stuff. Like mm -hmm. it's this weird dichotomy of like, he's more put together in some areas than Book Tyson, but also incredibly not put together in other things. And then everybody hates him. Yeah. It's just very strange. I don't hate him. Good. I love him. <laughs> Good, as you he's, should. He's a big old himbo and I love him. <laughs> so then they call in Percy to meet Tyson and the CGI, which I have to give credit, I have to give credit. There was someone on the stream who called out, calling it CGI EYE. -E. And we noticed that on the stream, but it was someone referencing the earlier joke. So I gave the shout out to the wrong person. So I'm gonna edit it in after because I didn't have enough time to like go through the downloaded version and scroll through the chat and figure out exactly what happened. So I will put it in the podcast to give the person proper credit. So I know that I need to give them a direct thing. So everyone here in the show, make sure you listen to the episode so that you know that person's name and they get their proper credit. Hello, this is Mike from the future. The person who made the first CGI comment was Patrick Spitz. Shout out to you, Patrick. You deserve the full praise and now you've gotten it here in this episode. Anyway, let's get back to the podcast. But the CGI is rough. It is not great to make him a Cyclops. And I pointed this out on the stream, but the big reason is that the way that they've done it is you can still see like his facial muscles move. You can tell it's a person who has two eyes because he will squint and then the eye will kind of close a little, but then you'll see like the crow's feet or whatever, you know, show up on the two sides very far away from his singular eye. Yeah. And it is just so uncomfortable to look. It's just totally super right. uncanny valley. Yeah. It, it doesn't work at all. And it's not how I imagine a Cyclops eye would look either. It looks like kind of out of resolution and like they took one of his eyes and like made it really like yeah, that might large, but not did. large enough. Yeah. And not Maybe not the right shape. I don't know what's wrong with it. It's just not right. No, I think it's not big enough to cover up. They either have to make it bigger or they got to do stuff to cover up and like yeah. add different facial expressions because mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. cheek muscles are all, it's all wrong. It's all wrong. <laughs> but Tyson speaks, you know, perfect, normal, not naive, young English. Like he's just a well-spoken dude and a bunch of campers dislike him, I guess, cause everybody's racist in this one. They show just like a bunch of campers being like, Ugh. like at least Annabeth has a reason. It's a bad reason, but at least she yeah. has like a reason. Mm -hmm. They just show like three people being like grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> when that was happening, I was like, have any of you read the Greek myths? Cause people are wild in those stories. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, then this is what you guys are getting up in arms about? <laughs> That's where they draw the line. 
So Tyson then has the stereotypical awkward eating too much scene because this is just a teen movie. And it also features a dated joke where they're talking about him being a cyclops. And then you have Grover say, I think the politically correct term is ocularly impaired. Like, oh, my God. Like what 50 year old white dude was like, yeah, this is a banger. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta learn new words. Ugh. So Clarice then shames Tyson into wearing some shades. And I'm sure the VFX team rejoiced in jubilation. But then of course the Colchis Bull shows up and I just thought it was funny. The Colchis Bull is rumbling and then they show a table and some orange juice falls over and then it rumbles some more. And then there's some orange juice put all the way on the edge. <laughs> all the way on the edge of the table and then two glasses fall over and then you hear just the loudest glass shattering <laughs> fully possible. Like this glass <laughs> fell from 12 stories up. This was the introduction of my favorite non-character, Chris Rodriguez. He is a character in the books. Well, he is not in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> But boy, he sure gets name dropped a lot. I, lo I loved how like there were every few scenes they were just like, Chris. <laughs> and there's all these, you know, amazing like Greek names. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, Chris. <laughs> I was just like, I don't, I don't know about this one. Yeah. So it's more pandering, I think, to let us know that that is Chris indeed. Because he's important in the books. In other ways, he has a personality and a story. But in this, he's just Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the way that you find out that this is Chris is everyone goes to defend camp from the bull. Everyone leaves, every single person. And then Percy turns around and goes, hey, Chris, you coming? And Chris goes, nah, I'm good. <laughs> And then Percy, later in the film, is surprised yeah. that Chris is evil. Oh, yes. are, are you suspicious at this point of Chris when he doesn't join? <laughs> no, I, quality film. <laughs> He's like, I gotta drink this orange juice, guys. It was very much like the Sorcerer's Stone film when Quirrell stands up after he gets knocked over at the Quidditch match and is just like, ah, oh, darn. <laughs> 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 What's also very fun is that Chris Rodriguez, at least the actor who plays him, is 37 years old. Oh my gosh. He's so old. He's so old. Yeah, this, oh this movie more than the first one. I'm assuming, again, budget issues, but like we're having a real Grease situation <laughs> at Camp Half Blood. Like everyone is. Grease, G R E A S E. <laughs> Everybody is very old. Very, yes. very Half -Blood. old. Yeah. So Tyson is wearing his sunglasses right now, right? Correct. Which means he can't see now. Because well, the nose bridge is in front of oh his eyes. Oh my God. They yeah. are like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Terminator 1. I at least guess. you would hope that they have. But yeah, it should be certainly harder to it see. It would be the hardest for him to see now because he's got yeah. directly in front right. of his eye, mm -hmm. which is just, I guess, really sad that, that he feels he has to do this because yeah. Annabeth hates him so much. Yes, she really, really does. Mm -hmm. So the bull breaks the barrier and the bull CGI is fine. The barrier breaking CGI is terrible, but... You realize what they were doing here and in a lot of the film, they must be fans of Jungkook because it's time for 3D. And <laughs> I can't, I can kind of see your notes a little bit. And I saw Jungkook coming. And I was like, what are we going to say about Jungkook? <laughs> yep, <laughs> what what yep. are we going to say about BTS that? <laughs> stand alongside me. But yeah, this movie very much came out in the era of everything is 3D because everything that happens in this fight happens towards the viewer. <laughs> I, I, I knew this was going to happen in this era when they reintroduced 3D during the 2000s, 2010s. Some people love it and I'm so happy for you, but I <laughs> hated it. It was because it's a gimmick. I enjoy the 3D and a lot of people, there's a lot of debate about this. I prefer the 3D where it adds depth to the screen. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like when they did it to like Nightmare Before Christmas and Beauty and the Beast, yeah, I was Pixar like, that's pretty, I like, like that. I like yeah. this. But when it is so intentional that it is popping out of I'm, I always know that this is going to be terrible to watch at home. Yeah. And I knew that was going to happen for when I saw it. When I saw it last night, I was like, oh, I know exactly what year this came out just <laughs> watching it. And it, it, I feel the same way like with the with the Harry Potter films with Deathly Hallows Part 2 is extremely egregious with it. And it's awful how these films are going to be so dated now. Like, But they thought they were so cool at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel so. like with 3D, the only time it's acceptable is when you fully, fully lean into it. And the only good version of 3D is Muppets 3D at Disney. Yes. <laughs> I was about to say that. <laughs> Quality. Yes. They just do it as a bit the whole time. And they're like, what if we just blow the party thing? The on screen the whole time, like, yeah, that's fun. Like, just 
it's ridiculous and bad, but like, Keep it at the theme what's park. weird is we went recently <laughs> and it's so silly that you watch it and you're like, that actually looks kind of good. Like, yeah. It does look like that guy's bouncing <laughs> out people's heads. I was 100% enchanted by that ride as a child. It was my favorite like, thing as a kid. It yeah. makes sense that I would grow up to be like the guy who did improv and silly goose and stuff. Like, <laughs> everyone was like, let's go on the rides. I was like, can we watch the Muppets again? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm more enchanted as an adult by that ride than I was as a kid. That's fair. <laughs> I went on, I think it's like the Disney Symphony thing where they do 3D yeah, with that right, too. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that one also, I, and I saw that for the first time as an adult and was just like, oh, <laughs> this is so magical. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, there are there are moments when it works really well. Yeah, mm -hmm. back to the moments where it doesn't. So yeah. <laughs> Percy's fighting. I was really trying to move the conversation <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> Percy's fighting the bull. And he does something that he does to the Minotaur in book one. So in book one, when he fights the Minotaur, he's wearing a red rain jacket and he uses it as like a Toro Toro thing. What he does here is he takes the banners, which are orange, which I guess is close enough. And no, he, he, it's the red it's the red flag from the Capture the Flag game. That's, oh, that's first, what that is? Yeah. Oh, so no. I thought it was just one of the orange Camp Half-Blood banners because I don't know if this one has it. I have to look. But they have banners in the background that have the logo for Camp Half-Blood, which is supposed to be a Pegasus. But in this movie, it's just a trident. So I guess everyone that's not a son of Poseidon, it's like, kick rocks, nerd. Like, we, we like Percy, the one kid, the one guy who's had... <laughs> <laughs> who is a heir of Poseidon or a son of Poseidon. They call him heir in this movie. But like, it's just so wild that they were like, yep, that's got to be the logo, mm -hmm. the trident. So he uses that to kind of Toro Toro it. And then Annabeth tries to jam a spear into it, but the gears of the bull like grind it yeah, up. Yeah, she keeps trying. Yeah. <laughs> and like, like, it's like, till the last tiny splinter is in there, and she yes. kind of puts it in there. She's like, maybe it'll eventually work. And then the metal part falls to the ground, and the Foley again. You can very much tell the Foley is someone dropping a coin onto a tile floor. Like, it's just so weird. They're like, it drops, and then you hear like, cha-ching, cha-ching. Like, okay, I guess that's what the spear tip falling on the grass sounds like. <laughs> So then Clarice tries to get on and ride it like a bull. She fails to defeat it. Tyson puts in some good work, proves that Cyclopes are fireproof, and I guess his clothes work kind of like how Percy's stayed dry when he gets into water. His mm -hmm. clothes are fine by the fire. But what's weird is they show lots of scenes of like hands grabbing spears and shields and swords and then no one else <laughs> fighting the bull. Yeah. No one else. There's a lot of campers standing around watching. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people running very rapidly. Mm -hmm. But like not towards the one thing yep. that is attacking the camp. I did feel it was funny that they like showed a lot of like the young campers getting massacred, but they're not, they're not dead. <laughs> but then like after the opening where they murdered a tiny child. Yes, yes, yes. They were like, no, no, no. But these camp, they're fine. They're fine. <laughs> they'll, they'll you noted there was a lot of like people laying on the ground and there's taking a long of, time to get up. There's lots of falling over taking a long time to get up and then running away as if nothing's wrong. Like mm -hmm. Annabeth falls over and she lays on the ground looking at Percy. Percy runs over and helps her up. She needs zero help and then they both just run away. It's the weirdest. It bugged me so badly. Yeah. Percy then kind of grappling hooks it and gets dragged along. And then he gets brought to an area near the big house and just one-on-one -on -one fights the bull for mm -hmm. a long amount of time. Yep. Like it's a very lengthy fight and no one else is like, where's Percy? Where's the bull we're fighting? Like it's just <laughs> him versus the bull. He defeats it in what is kind of a cool move where he like clicks the pen click version of Riptide and throws it into the sword. And you see like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I'll take it. The CGI is kind of fun. But the big thing is, where is everybody? Yeah. Where is Chiron? Where is Mr. D? And while I was wondering where Mr. D is, it gets referenced in a little bit. But before that can happen, Luke shows up because apparently he's behind the bull. Not a thing in the book, right? The bull just like attacks it. I think like, so. I don't think like it was necessarily, if it was sent by Luke, it wasn't necessarily as direct. Maybe they right. did. Whatever. Luke shows up and he says, next time you try and drown someone, make sure they're not a demigod who can swim. <laughs> saying it as if like most demigods can't swim. It's just such a weird way to phrase it. Yeah. <laughs> such a weird way to phrase it. He then puts a weird, strange glass orb into his pocket, mm -hmm. which before the you show- You had to explain that to me. Yeah, you were like, what's the thing he puts in his pocket? I was like, that is the implied poison that Percy calls out in <laughs> yeah. a little bit. But he puts that into his pocket and then Luke introduces the prophecy, which is supposed to be a big overarching thing throughout mm -hmm. the books that Percy knows from basically day one. But they're just trying to get in anything that movie one cast aside. They're just really injecting it as early as they can. And then Luke kind of says some vague stuff, does some vague sort of like they don't 
treat you well, blah, blah, blah. And then he uses a teleportation device yeah. to leave. Another glowing orb that he pulls out of his pocket. Yeah, the classic yeah. demigod teleportation <laughs> Power Ranger morphin thing that we all know and love. I'm gonna fixate on this a little bit, Please. obsessively, as a as a film student, because when you do a close up on an object in somebody's hand, you're probably trying to tell the audience that that thing is important and will be a reference later. And this scene has two of those. It has Luke putting the bottle in the pocket. And when you explained to me that that was the poison that he gave to the magical tree, mm -hmm. I was like, that's not how you poison a tree. <laughs> you you do something bad to the soil. Like you don't you don't like he I know the tree used to be a girl, so I'm assuming he just like dipped it in where her face was, but which was wild, but then uh, then to show the teleportation device too, because we've come from a first movie where they have really thoroughly been like, the lightning bolt, mm -hmm. here it is in their hand, we're gonna talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. But then they introduce this green thing, mm -hmm. teleportation mm -hmm. device, it never gets talked about again. Yeah. No, it. and it apparently does get used again, but, but not, never talked about. But it's about. not in the book. No, not at all, no. nothing oh, okay. at all. Cool. Yep. A major <laughs> thing in the books to make them fun and entertaining is that like it's hard to just do travel that can go quickly mm -hmm. percy can't fly because zeus is the lord of the skies and is a beef against percy so that like makes the book take longer mm -hmm. but now it's just like luke can teleport now i was gonna ask where luke went in the book in this scene but i guess he wasn't even there in the first place no no, no. He's a, no yeah. it's a he's i would have really liked it if he had just run away <laughs> 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 so then after this happens we see percy walking to the rest of the camp Everyone was like, I guess, pretty close by, but not helping him fight the bull. And then Mr. D goes, what did I miss? A lot. You missed a lot. <laughs> You're in charge of the camp. What is yeah. happening? <laughs> and then this is where Chiron, very much like a human, walks over to the tree. They realize it's poison. Or no, actually, they don't realize it's poison. Percy from the back has to go, Luke, poison the tree. <laughs> Nobody asks how he knows this. They all just take him at face value. They're like, yeah, that sounds right. I also wondered how does he know this? Because I didn't get that the blue thing was poison. I didn't either, but the thing that, made me realize it is like the only way that Percy comes to this conclusion is he saw Luke very dramatically put something into his pocket mm -hmm. and then talk about the tree being poisoned. So this has to be it. Well, and then Chiron, I guess, extracts some of the poison because he puts a blue vial yes. into his pocket right. after tending mm -hmm. to the tree. Yeah. Makes me suspicious of Chiron. As it should. I don't know. As it should. How do you extract the poison from the tree? Maybe Chiron know. is the sea of monsters. <laughs> so. <laughs> After... <laughs> Look, Luke called himself the lightning seed 12 times in the first one. <laughs> so after Percy comes up and says Luke poisoned the tree, Clarice goes, yay, you're alive. Out of line, Clarice. Yeah. <laughs> Out of line. We know you don't like him, but like that's so a step too far. Just, in, as you said, lazy bully. I was gonna say it's in keeping with the lazy bully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, it's like how Drake used to do. He'd be like, "Your parents are dead." Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> cool joke, man. <laughs> Percy is then explaining a little bit more about what Luke told him because Luke villain monologue did explain his whole secret <laughs> yeah. plot, and then Percy calls the half bloods who have turned demi titans. Which is not a term that Luke used, not a term in the book at all, yep. not a thing. And Percy, I don't know if he invented this. No one questions it. No one asks who are those. Yeah. He's just like, yeah, I got a cool name for him. He just uses it in a sentence as if we're supposed to know that already. It's why. Yeah. It's absolutely why. 100% wasn't listening at that point. <laughs> Like real, like he, you saying that, I was like, oh yeah, no, I don't think I heard the dialogue at all. <laughs> yeah. No, it's tough. Did not care. No. So Percy then asks about the prophecy because Luke alluded to the prophecy and Chiron says- Oh, is this the part where Chiron is like stirring those potions? He's making an answer. <laughs> he does knock something yeah. over that is, I hope, completely empty because he does not pick it back up or act like anything spilled. It's probably orange juice. There's a lot oh, gotta of be, gotta be, gotta be. <laughs> So he asks Chiron about the prophecy and Chiron, which is a very book Chiron move, says knowledge isn't always power, Percy. Chiron is always withholding information so that the mm -hmm. plot can develop. And then we see Annabeth who has an iPad yeah. with these pages of <laughs> Greek things, but just nonsense Greek letters, like not words, not the thing where it's like Sea of Monsters with kind of Greek letters. It's literally someone just punched the keyboard on wingdings <laughs> mode and they were just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But when we were watching this on the Patreon stream, Emily pointed out that like a lot of those characters are not Greek at all. It's just nonsense. But what's also nonsense is that on the iPad, it has like pages of an old book, but it's not like scanned pages, but the pages are still like yellowed as if it's <laughs> from an old text. So bizarre. She's swiping through the iPad. Then Percy has to go talk to the Oracle who's weirdly robotic and is voiced by that one lady from season four of 24. It and looks like a scene from the Pirates of the Caribbean Disney ride. Yes, oh, 100%. There. Big animatronic vibes. Yeah, 100%. definitely. And I think she's dressed like a pirate too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> very strange. So then we get the stained glass CGI version of the prophecy, which like does look kind of cool. The yeah, but is cool. stained glass, like very much a fixture is... You know, we made a joke earlier about the Christian deities. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we're here we are again. Like I'm thinking to movies like say that for an example, I was thinking about with this scene, the Prince of Egypt, you know, it animates the hieroglyphics because that's an Egyptian thing. And here we are animating stained glass, which that's is a point. very Christian church aesthetic, not mm -hmm. very Greek, considering mm -hmm. that the Greeks have a pretty clear aesthetic that we've seen in many a movie that you could have fun animating with. Sure. There was a whole Disney movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> where they did that. But, <laughs> alas, alas, instead we I get was this. distracted by the fact that it was pretty. Um, it is pretty. But, yeah, but it's it true. worked it's on you. <laughs> it did. It's weird, and it's not just a prophecy. She, like, explains the whole backstory yes. of, like, right, we didn't do any of this in the first movie. And she so, explains it wrong, too. Yes, because they have to retroactively make the first movie work. Yeah. It's ridiculous. You know what so, it reminded me of? Once upon a time, yeah, mm -hmm. long time ago. Very ago. Beauty and the three. Beast. Oh, that's oh, I yes. thought we were go it is the opening thing. of Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Beauty and the Beast did it better. Mm -hmm. So then she explains the whole Kronos thing, who's the overarching villain of the series that didn't find his way into the first movie at all. But she explains it incorrectly because she says Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon escaped his stomach together and defeated Kronos. Just supposed to be Zeus. <laughs> I yep. like the what? <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Don't watch the movie. <laughs> Then after explaining this, says they defeated Kronos, but Kronos is fated to rise again, which is very somehow Palpatine returns. <laughs> yeah. and then the Oracle continues saying, only a child of the big three can defeat him, either ending him or civilization. And then I guess to make the first movie make sense, it all begins when two cousins grapple for a fleece, the son of the sea and the lightning thief. No, no, <laughs> no, not a thing. Just terrible, terrible, terrible. And then after this happens, Percy just goes, Luke, as if we didn't remember from the six times Luke called himself the lightning thief, that Luke is the lightning thief. Prophecy continues, and that half-blood of the eldest gods shall reach 20 against all odds, because they've aged it up from 16 to 20, mm -hmm. and see the world in endless sleep, the evil soul curse blade shall reap. So it's just- Is this prophecy in the book? Yes, it's like a thing that Percy learns early on. It's like this overarching thing that's supposed to do the entire series. Yeah. But it doesn't get, you don't like actually hear it until, do well, you? This prophecy isn't in the book. <laughs> this this no, 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 never no. But some of these lines like the curse blade shall reap and stuff, that gets introduced in book five. Like it's yes. the end of the series prophecy yeah. that kind of informs things. There's other prophecies There's, that they base their quests off of, but the yeah. larger overarching prophecy I don't think is introduced until later. Okay, because the thing that was bothering me about it while I was watching it, because having not seen my beloved himbo for like the last 10 minutes <laughs> of, of screen time, I was like, that could be Tyson technically if you're talking about a son of the, cause, and I thought that that might be the trick that the film was setting up mm -hmm. because why would you introduce a secret half brother if maybe he could also yeah. fulfill the prophecy and then the end of the movie happens and you're like, oh, never mind that. That had nothing to do with that. <laughs> All of the prophecies are supposed to be very vague and a big yeah. thing is who is it, who is it? But yeah, this is just weird. It says the child of the eldest God. Yeah. Not of one of the eldest gods. So oh. of the eldest gods. Yeah. Poseidon. Unless the closed captions were well, no, it's I think it's saying of the three. So it's saying Poseidon because I think Poseidon is the oldest of the big three. No. Is he not? No. Zeus came first? No, no wait. Oh, no, no, sorry. No. no, no. Zeus is the youngest. Zeus is the youngest. Or he's at least younger Hades than Poseidon. I Hades was older Hades than... Hades is older. Ah, so they were super wrong. Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> and also, Hades has older sisters. They're, it's not the eldest god. The oh, eldest you're, god yeah, yeah. Oh, the first, yeah, the is first like one Demeter, is... Demeter, no, right? yeah, no, no, no. Demeter second. First is Hestia. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so when they said the eldest god, I was like, 
Hestia's kids coming yeah. back? Like, God. what's happening Ridiculous. here? Absolutely. The script writers were definitely not having these yeah. discussions. I don't know. <laughs> it's just the most it's basic wild. discussion you could have. Yeah. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. So I want to close out because I want to do a kind service to everyone here in Austin is leave you with the the highlight of at least the beginning, which is Tucci again. <laughs> so we'll end on a wonderful Tucci note. After all this crap, Percy talks to Chiron and it's all the like preserve a raise thing. And I checked which raise it is. You then have a scene where Annabeth is begging Mr. D to go on a quest for the fleece because they've done this weird thing where book two, which is like the most non-essential to the overarching story has now become the thing that is supposed to solve like the main crux of book five. <laughs> like the fleece is gonna save the world. It's ridiculous. So she's trying to do that. And Mr. D is arguing with her about it. She apparently always wants to go on a quest. He has this big pull down map and is saying like the Bermuda Triangle, the Sea of Monsters <laughs> and all this stuff. And then it ends with him saying, it's a terrible idea. And then it immediately cuts to him in front of a group saying, I've had a grand idea. <laughs> so good. It's like the only part of the movie where I actually laughed out yes, loud. Yes, <laughs> it might be the one thing where I genuinely laughed. Tucci then starts spouting like exact quotes that Annabeth had said to him, which is funny. He's got one thing where he's like got part of it written on his hand and he has to check it. It's phenomenal. I do, I do, no, I know. I know we were kind of getting down on Alexandra Daddario. And again, she has an Emmy. She's fine. Well, a nomination. No. Um, but I did also laugh when she went. Yeah. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> so I was very tired, too. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Tucci continues to explain that a satyr has to go because satyrs are drawn to the flea so naturally. It's got to be our old friend that we know and love from the books, Iknute. <laughs> Random buff horned satyr from before. We did learn this when we were in the stream, but like the Iknute is a play about satyrs. The thing from the internet I found, quote, the Iknute, also known as the searchers, trackers, or tracking satyrs, is a fragmentary satyr play by the fifth century Athenian dramatist Sophocles. So I guess they're really trying to pull to Greek people. They'll be like, I get it. I don't know. So they have like one nerdy conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that happens. Then Mr. D picks Clarice and they're about to go on the quest. And that is where we will end this portion of the episode of The Newest Olympian. If you're listening after, we'll do Q&A after. And that is where we're going to get into intermission here for the show. So let's all first say goodbye to the podcast people. <gasps> goodbye, podcast people. Hello and welcome to the Sea of Sponsors. We are back in the Sea of Sponsors. It's been a minute, but we've got a bunch of fun updates. First and foremost, the Heroes of Olympus era of the News Olympian is starting soon. And if you want to hear my first reactions to the Heroes of Olympus, you can go and get tickets to the live stream of the live show we're doing in Charlotte, because that is going to be over the opening chapters of book one, The Lost Hero of Heroes of Olympus. So I've got two live shows coming up in the near future, March 9th and March 10th, both in North Carolina, the first in Raleigh, the second in Charlotte. But that Charlotte show is going to be streamed. We'll have a multi-camera setup. You can watch it live. There will be a replay. So if the day and time doesn't work for you, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Sunday, March 10th, if that doesn't work out for you, you can watch a replay or you can watch part of it. You can do whatever you want. You get seven days of replay if you get a ticket and you can see me and Michael Hollis cover the first couple of chapters of the first book. I'm super stoked to bring that to you folks to do it in a live show setting will be a great way to kick off the Heroes of Olympus era. You'll be able to hear my thoughts much earlier than normal because I will still be posting the audio from that show on the feed, but it wouldn't be until like April. So if you just can't wait, you don't have to. You can go to thenewsolympian.com slash live and get tickets to that live stream. And as I said, it comes with a replay so you don't necessarily have to watch it live. There will be a live chat so you can chat with other people who are watching. We end the live show with Q&A so you can send in questions even from your couch. So that'll be fun. So that'll be a show where the first act is the News Olympian and then we'll do a little bit of Potterless stuff in Act 2 and then end the show with Q&A. Should be a really fun time and tickets are live at thenewsolympian.com slash live. Also, many people ask that I record when I am reading certain portions of the book, and oftentimes that's hard because I'm either in transit or busy or not around my microphone equipment, whatever it may be. But I did record myself reading the first couple of pages of the first book, The Lost Hero. So if you go to Patreon, if you're at the bonus episode tier and above, you can hear me read like the first nine pages or so. It's just 11 minutes of me reading it out loud to Kelly and then voicing my initial thoughts. But I am a couple pages in to Heroes of 
of Olympus and I'm enjoying it. It's pretty fun. And you can hear my thoughts if you go to thenewsolympian.com slash Patreon. I would also love to thank the folks who came out to our recent live shows that we did in Florida and Denver and Phoenix. All of those shows were absolutely wonderful. Met a bunch of really nice folks along the way. Thank you all so much. All the crowds were hype and it was a really fun time. So I very, very much appreciate you all for coming through. Speaking of appreciation, I did mention that Patreon earlier and there are folks who are supporting on Patreon. Thank you all so much for making this job of mine possible. And I want to give a shout out to the folks who have joined most recently. So shout out to our newest God tier patrons, Sarah Stevens, Once Potterhead 7, Corey Fredericks, and Rinka in Paradise. And shout out to our newest demigod tier patrons, Ruby Ostro, Max Holgate, Justin Ludwig, Ari, David Rojas, and Jen. Thank you all so much for your support. May Athena bless you that if you are ever planning road trips and stuff, you just hit everything perfectly. You go to all the right places. You avoid traffic. You make the perfect pit stops. You pick out the right gas stations to refill your car, whatever it is. May she bless you and your planning prowess. I am happy to report that the TNO beads have been shipping out to folks. Seems like a lot of people have been receiving them. Thank you, everyone who's been tagging me in the photos. That's very fun. But you can get beads that have jokes from the PJO book episodes of TNO. One bead has a pigeon. One bead has a hairbrush. One bead has a trapdoor for the guests. One bead has a plot shield for Chiron. And one has a juniper tree for the real spy. And it comes with a little lanyard, little string with it. So you can make a necklace or they can fit on other necklaces. I also saw people weaving them into keychains and stuff like that. There's so many cool things you can do with the beads, but there's those. The My Other Pen is Riptide pen is back in stock. I got to figure out what's going on with the Camp Regular Person shirts, so I'll talk to my merch people because those should have already been back in stock by now. And there's new merch on the horizon, and it all lives at thenewsolympian.com slash merch. Now, if you're all caught up on the Newest Olympian and you're looking for some new podcasts to listen to, I make a whole bunch of podcasts. I'm an independent podcast boy. I think you might enjoy some of the other shows that I make, and one of the other shows that I make that I think you might enjoy is Horse. Horse is a comedic basketball podcast that I co-host with my buddy Adam Amawala, and we are here to prove that basketball is fun for everyone to follow, not just sports heads. We prove this by focusing on the dramatic side of the sport. We talk about things going on in the news. We talk about funny stories from history. That is something that will get referenced in the very fun Q&A in this episode, where I talk about Larry Bird and how he's a ridiculous person. We've had funky Larry Bird stories on the pod, so you can listen to Horse wherever you get your podcasts by searching for horse or going to our website, horsehoops.com. Now, unless you are listening via Patreon where you get access to ad-free episodes, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of those ads will be read by me. Others of them won't be. The ones that aren't read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in North Carolina, don't be surprised if you hear me talking about the North Carolina shows that are coming up in March because I have programmed a locally inserted ad to say, hey, you should come to the shows. But once those ads are complete, we will get back into this episode of the New Olympian, which will be the Q&A portion from this live show, which was really fun. There were some really, really fun questions in this one. I think you will enjoy it. And we'll get to that very soon. We will now conclude the show by doing some Q&A. Shout out to everybody who sent questions. We're not going to have time to get through all of them, but thank you to everyone who sent them. So this first one is from JJ. I'm answering this one because JJ put an awesome live show as the subject line and then said, it's for scientific research purposes. Please, we drove six hours to ask you this. <laughs> Hi, Mike. I have a list of characters that I call Percy Jackson variants. Example, Sokka from Avatar, James Potter, Lance McLean from Voltron. Do you have any characters that fit that? So to my understanding, this would be just like characters that feel like Percy Jackson but are in different universes? Okay, hmm. A character that feels like Percy that is in a different universe. Um, I would like to pick Larry Bird from the National Basketball Association. <laughs> because Larry Bird was very good at basketball. And he would talk trash a ton and then still be very good at the thing. Larry Bird had this thing where he would, like, he would tell his opponent defending him, like, here's the move I'm going to do. And then he would do it. Like, he would tell his defender, like, I'm going to do this. And then he would do it. And then he would still score. One time, he scored a whole bunch of points against a team only using his left hand because they were playing the Lakers after that. And he wanted his, and he said he wanted to save his right hand for the Lakers. <laughs> He's a monster. If you want to hear fun Larry Bird stories, listen to Horse. So I'm going to pick Larry Bird for Percy Jackson Coded. JJ says, please come to Louisiana. Stay tuned. There might be a live show in Louisiana in 2024. It's in the works. So 
get ready. And everybody be like, JJ, drive six hours, go to Louisiana. <laughs> this next one is from Abby. On the flip side, the subject line is Austin Live Show. I came from three blocks away. <laughs> <laughs> The Alpha, the Omega. Hi, Mike. I have a very important Texas-centered question for you. What signature HEB item would each PJO character choose as their favorite item? And why is one of them the tortillas? Love the pod. Look, I could write thesis statements about the mitad y mitad tortillas from HEB. Percy Jackson characters picking signature items from HEB. Oh, man. I feel like... Gosh, there's so many good choices. Gosh, I love H-E-B so much. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so hard. I'm trying to think of if any of them are blue for Percy or if anything are like liquid. Uh, there's this, oh, you know what? Percy, Percy might pick, what's the H-E-B version of Dr. Pepper? Isn't it like Dr. B? Dr. B. <laughs> Thank you, because he's very excited about the Dr. Pepper that they get to drink, I think, in Sea of Monsters. So I feel like he would pick Dr. B. That would be pretty good. Tyson, I think he's gonna pick the sticker machine at the end of checkout with H-E Buddy, the brown paper bag friend. I feel like he's gonna pick that. And then I, Ed, I can't like really weigh on this because you yeah. know my history with Percy Jackson, right, right, right. but I I just have to say that I recently discovered, thanks to one of my coworkers at the library, that they have uh, H E B has a, a like generic Robitussin that's just called Tussin. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's good. That's really good. It sits across me in our in our bathroom at work, just on a little cart. And every time I sit down, I'm just like, nah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna say Cersei would pick. There's a real. This is just so I can get excuse to talk about this cereal. HB has like a mango flakes cereal that's really good and turns your milk orange. Uh, and that feels very tropical. So that feels like Cersei to me. It's super good. They also have horchata crisp, which is just like rice krispies but horchata flavored. Oh my god, guys. <laughs> It's so good. It's so good. I feel like Grover would pick, I'm going to say Grover would pick the candles because it's not food, but they're all food scented and he would eat them because he eats, Grover canonically eats like trash and recyclables and stuff. And they have like the, the butter popcorn and the tortilla and the brownie fudge candles. So I feel like he would pick that. And then Annabeth would pick the tortillas because it's the correct answer. <laughs> so that is the H-E-B. <laughs> God, that was fun. Thank you for that question. That was such a good question. I've, I've really been shopping at H-E-B wrong. I've learned oh, so much. There's, there are, God, there's so much. So, God, I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Georgie here, proud Gryffindor and daughter of Athena. If you were drafting a 3v3 basketball game between Harry Potter and PJO characters, who would be the worst players to have on your team? And most importantly, who would be the last pick? Hope you're enjoying your time in Texas and get your fill of Texas food and H-E-B tortillas. Ha ha. Yeah. Everyone knows me so well. Okay, so 3v3 basketball, we're picking people who'd be the worst. So I would say, maybe you can pick, you pick the three Harry Potter people that'd be the worst. I'll pick the three oh, Percy the three, Jackson people okay. who'd be the worst at basketball. You go first, because I yeah. don't remember anything about Harry Potter anymore. I mean, just pick the, <laughs> for the worst, the worst PJO people, I'm gonna, uh, I feel like, well, I need someone small and unathletic, because if tall people can at least like play good defense, but if someone is just like tiny and unathletic, I mean, maybe, oh, Juniper would be a pretty good pick. She would be pretty good. She's like a tree nymph, so I don't think she's gonna know how to hoop. So I don't think she's gonna be particularly good. Hmm. I feel like, no, Rachel Elizabeth Dare, I feel like she's a secret hooper. Like Rachel Elizabeth Dare, I think she knows how to hoop. I'm gonna pick Zoe Nightshade just because she's like so old. She's gonna be like, what is basketball? Like, I think she's gonna be pretty bad. Her skills are with archery. That's like, I don't know that she's gonna be able to dribble and everything. And then, no, Tyson's tall. He's gonna be good. He, yeah, but he's tall. He can at least block. Um, someone else. Oh, that's a good one. Rainbow the Hippoc Hippocampus is a pretty good pick because they would need water. So that's my three. <laughs> Who are your three bad at basketball Harry Potter characters? See, they're such obvious picks, so uh, y'all can help me add any of the more like obscure ones you think of. But the one thing is I do still read Harry Potter out loud to my brother every Friday, and that's like the only Harry Potter thing I do anymore. And so I, I am reading, we're going through Order of the Phoenix right now, and I was like, yeah, Ron is pretty bad at sports and like doesn't really get better. So I'm kind of, and like he's in the sport that is at, in a way what they're just like, oh, it's, Quidditch like basketball, mm -hmm. and everybody's like, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm gonna say Ron. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I feel bad saying this, but I mean, this is also an obvious pick. Hermione is going to be terrible. At oh, it. yeah. Um, this yeah, is yeah. not her realm. Not her um, realm. Somebody say Dobby. No, Dobby's <laughs> got magic. He's no, got Dobby magic. would be great. Yeah. Dobby would be fine. Um, the, the giant squid's going to kill it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, Amazing. but I I think for all of his talk, too, with sports, Malfoy would also be terrible <laughs> oh, at yeah. basketball. But he would also be, you know, the one who would always be doing fake outs, too. He'd constantly be dropping to the floor all the time mm. being like, I yeah, I think so, yeah, I like that, and I think last pick is Hermione. No one's gonna, she's not gonna be good. No one's gonna think that she's gonna be good. Sorry, Hermione. Sorry, Hermione. You're suited for other things. So many other things. Yeah. All right. This one comes from Travis. Travis says, "Subject line: Austin Show. Can you thank Carrie for me? Carrie couldn't come to the show because of a family emergency, so she gave my wife and me her tickets. We wouldn't have been able to come otherwise. So shout out Carrie for me. Shout out to Carrie. Hope everything's all right. Now for the question: Which of your many fun pairs of socks do you think best represents the different Percy Jackson characters? Do have a lot of socks. Um, oh man. Um, Percy, I have a pair of socks that are, one sock is Shaggy surfing on a big wave, and one is Scooby-Doo surfing on a big wave. It feels pretty Percy to me. Annabeth, I weirdly don't have any owl socks, even though I went to Rice. Um, so I should get on that. I should get on that, but all the socks Rice makes is boring. Otherwise, I would have Rice socks. Um, Grover, I've got like a bunch of different floral socks, so I feel like Grover would like one of those because it's very nature-esque. I'm trying to think of anything else. You all know my sock drawer, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, weirdly, I can't help you with yeah, this I know. One. <laughs> I know. I really know. I have a bunch of different socks from like various hip hop groups. I don't know why the Stool Brothers feel like they'd be into hip hop. So I got a pair of Wu-Tang socks. I feel like they would like it. <laughs> I just feel like they would be down with the Wu-Tang Clan. So I'm going to say Connor and Travis Stoll have, uh, are my Wu-Tang socks. All right. That's that. Gosh, that was like a crisis. I need to think <laughs> about that and answer that. Um, this one is from, is it Abriel? Abriel. Abriel. Austin Show, very important question. Did you see they have an NBA Jam Machine? Are you going to play it? Did you plan this? Did not plan this. Did play it before the show. Yeah! It was fantastic. It, Kelly and I played it before we were setting up the merch table and I was prepping for the show. The game had like already loaded to where it was the Phoenix Suns versus the Chicago Bulls. The Chicago Bulls in NBA Jam Tournament Edition were one of the toughest opponents in the game. And the Suns like were pretty solid, but Kelly and I were playing and it was a heated battle. We at one point were down by like 20 and then we won on an incredible like 15-0 run, made it a close game. It went to overtime and we lost by one point. I know devastating. So after everyone leaves and we're done cleaning up and everything, I'm going to get my vengeance and Kelly and I will play again. Uh, did not plan it, but that should be a testament to how much dedication I have for the show. That's an NBA jam machine right there that I've been looking at the whole night and I still went through with the show. That is the dedication that I have to you fine folks. Uh, this one is from Kelsey. The subject line is I-35 sucks. Good luck. I like it. I like it. I'm a big fan of yours since early Potterless days. My question is, what reality and slash or TV game show would each Percy Jackson character be on and why? I feel like Annabeth is going to do well on Jeopardy, anything trivia related, stuff like that. Would any of them be good at I Because when you asked me about which reality show we should model the game mm -hmm. after, I was like, Lego Masters? Lego Masters? <laughs> That's like the only one I watch. Would any of the Percy Jackson characters be good at Lego Masters? I mean, Annabeth because architectural kind of stuff. Oh. Tyson also feels like he would just love Legos because he just loves things that are fun and joyful. He is big. I don't know if he's got the dexterity with the fingers because he's so large, but I think that would be, I think, I think Annabeth is probably the winner for Lego Masters for sure. Planning brain and all that. Any other reality shows? I mean, uh, I feel like Survivor, I feel like a lot of them would do pretty well at it. Like I think Percy, especially because Survivor often takes place on some sort of island or beach type thing. So Percy's always going to be around the water. There's a lot of water challenges. Well, as we saw in the opening of Sea of Monsters, Wipeout is... Yeah, Wipeout, right? <laughs> Clarice is clearly the best at Wipeout because <laughs> Percy keeps saving people for no reason. No reason at all. Okay, so this one is from Amanda. Amanda has the subject line is 1.5x speed listener from Austin. <laughs> Power to you. I talk so fast. <laughs> Hi, Mike. Tickets for the show came out the day before my birthday, so this was a nice present for me, and I will say it's nice to hear you talk at real person speed. <laughs> my question is, if you could create a crossover between either Percy Jackson, Harry Potter, and another fictional universe, what would it be based on what characters you'd like to see interact with other parts of the world. Also, fun side note, my first ever Instagram post was me watching the Lightning Thief movie in a Bud Light display at a Sam's Club. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. 
Well done. Now, I'll do the Percy Jackson, you do the Harry Potter. Oh, if you okay. were going to cross it over with another fictional universe, yeah. what would it be? And what kind of interactions would you like to see? I would love to see Percy Jackson cross over with Marvel just so that Percy and Spider-Man can interact oh. as our two like trash talking you New Yorker that's superheroes. Right. What that's about a, you? That's a really good choice. Thank you, thank um, you. Uh, this is just me trying to get um, gamer points. I've been playing a lot of um, Horizon Forbidden West oh, lately. Yeah. No spoilers because I've only Dawn. played Zero Dawn. But yeah. so good. I really like the idea of just like Hermione wandering into that world because she would be fascinated by dinosaur robots. Yeah. I think that's like mm. a really quality. Luna, can you imagine Luna? Oh, oh my gosh. It'd be so much fun. But yeah. I'm also playing a lot of Mass Effect right now as well and I feel like yeah. that would just be fun to dump them into that. <laughs> <laughs> be like, and no more wands, actual guns, <laughs> and nonsense. <laughs> okay, so this is gonna be the final question. This is from Abby and Alex, and I wanted to pick this one because I can tell, did you write it in Notes app and then copy paste it into the email? Okay, <laughs> I can tell this because I, so I did this once for, I can't get into details, but I did this once for a legal matter. Um, so I was sending an email and I had like, typed it up because I was like in transit while I was like crafting it. So I'd like crafted it all on my phone. And then I was using the Gmail app and like copy pasted it from there and just like sent it off. Then when I got the reply, like I had been using it on like on my phone and then did like header mode or whatever. So it was big so I could see what it was. And then when I like sent it, then like later on as this thread continued, I opened up a <laughs> the Gmail thing. And it was like, what it does is it like for Gmail, it makes it like Times New Roman looking, but because I had it on a bigger mode, it made it huge. <laughs> so I sent this email like about a pressing legal matter where everything was like normal Gmail. -y, and then I sent this thing in like giant Times New Roman font. That was, oh, it was, it was ridiculous. So I can tell you did it, so I want to pick your question, meaning you thought about it a lot ahead of time. This is gonna, we're gonna be how we close the show. So it says, hi, Mike. My name is Abby, and I'm here with my friend Alex. Alex introduced me to TNO in July this year, and I've now listened to every episode. Our question for you is, and then dramatic font change. <laughs> What's your favorite pasta and sauce combination? <laughs> I have perfect way to end the show. And a recommendation, cheese tortellini or cheese ravioli with a vodka sauce and fresh mozzarella. In parentheses, these can be made with not just cheese tortellini or ravioli, but it's really good. Thank you so much, Abby and Alex. Uh, as I've said many, many times in many, many of my podcasts, and I continue to repeat it all the time, I grew up in a very Italian part of New Jersey, so I am well-versed in pasta and sauce. And according to Ancestry.com or whatever, my mom is like 24% Italian, which I didn't know, so maybe it's more than just where I grew up, but... I feel very passionate about different pasta and sauce combinations. I do feel like if you're just going straight like a dish that is a noodle and a sauce, nothing else, because I don't want to get like spaghetti carbonara into the mix because then we're getting meat and egg and all these other things. If we're just going like sauce, pasta, you cannot top vodka rigatoni. Like it's just so perfect. The sauce is so nice and creamy, and then the ridges in the rigatoni are perfect. They hold it in. It crushes me when I go to a place that's like clearly not a well-versed Italian restaurant. Like the thing that non-Italian restaurants don't understand is that like specific noodles have to work for specific sauce. And like power to you if you like penne alla vodka, but like that's not the right noodle. Like you need <laughs> the ridges to hold in the sauce. It makes me so mad. It's like, it's just sliding off the penne because then what happens is you just get like this kind of watery with vodka stuff noodles and then a giant plate filled with vodka sauce left over. That doesn't work. If you have a bunch of bread and you scoop it up, sure, but <laughs> that's how I feel very passionate. Do you have a pasta and sauce combination that you feel very passionate about? Well, my mother was half Italian. Okay. So, and I don't know how she'd feel about this, but for those of you who enjoy a series of unfortunate events, um, Pasta puttanesca is a delightful oh, dish. Yeah, yeah. And if you've never done it with rotini. Oh, um, I love rotini. Thank I, you for doing this. Rotini is my favorite because that, that texture is solid. Oh. And that with that particular sauce, mm -hmm. the, the everything sauce is what it is really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect. Rotini is a really good one. Yes. Rotini is so solid. It's so fun. It's the spiral one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also sometimes called fusilli, even though I think they're like technically different. I think they're in different. A way, yeah, but but like, it, yeah. Sometimes people like call one one versus the other. But rotini is great. I used to get so much of the Berea Protein Plus rotinis when I was, you know, fresh out of college and be like, I don't have money. Let's make <laughs> pasta. But I feel healthier about it because it's made with chickpeas. <laughs> Berea, sponsor the show. But <laughs> rotini. Really, really solid. I like that yeah, a lot. Choice. Yeah, it's it's a really good one. Another thing that I'll just say while we're here, pesto, bow ties, that's the correct choice. <laughs> it holds it really well and it works well. 
That is our show. Thank you all so much for coming out. Give yourselves a round of applause for making it out to the show. Give it up to Kelly for guesting and running the merch table. Give it up to Michael for being an incredible guest for both acts. And give it up to everyone here, just from behind the scenes to Dan on the sound. Everyone just made this so fantastic. I love this venue. J.K. Rowling would despise this venue <laughs> because the, <laughs> the bathrooms just saying urinals or toilets. I was like, that makes so much sense. <laughs> and she would be like, this is what's wrong with the world. So that was fun. Everything about this was great. So give everyone here at the ballroom a huge round of applause for making this such a fun show. I really appreciate you all coming out. Thank you for anyone who drove far. Thank you for anyone who decides to come to other shows. Before we close it out, I do want to give an important yes. segue, though. Yeah. One quick thing. Actually, your thing about the bathrooms made me Maybe be like, I have something to plug. And it's not the bathrooms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> accidentally funny. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know, uh, Mike has been such a wonderful help with this. I am starting a podcast of my own. Um, it's called Pottering Off. And the whole idea is that it's time to move on from Harry Potter for us millennials. It's time to find other stories. As a librarian, a gay man, a person of color, I feel it's my responsibility to help stand up for the trans community because they've been doing so much work on their own. And so what I'm doing, and Mike is on the first episode, we are we are seeking out other stories, di more diverse stories from more diverse creators with more diverse characters. Once you let go of something, and I know it's hard to let go because I, I have been in that experience. That's part of the show. So my mother said very wisely after Deathly Hallows came out, I asked her, do you think that J.K. Rowling will do anything else with Harry Potter or write any other stories? And she said, you know what, Michael? Some people only have one good story to tell. And now I very thoroughly believe that. I want to help all of you find other stories. So before we go, I was actually hoping, because I just started the Instagram account, and I'm like, do you guys want to be my first picture? Can, yeah. I take <laughs> yeah. Can I take a selfie with all of you? Do it, do it, do it. This is why I had to charge my phone at the bar, because I was like, oh, God, I'm not going to get this memory. Do you want it to be a selfie, or do you want me to take a picture of you with the crowd? Even better. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Join us. Go. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. The Instagram is pottering off, so just search pottering off. That's all you have to search and pottering you'll find it. Pottering off. Pottering and, off. And I, is, is the first episode live yet? Or? Not quite yet. Okay, yeah, the, but when you get to it, I'm there and I talk all about uh, stories from San Antonio native Shea Serrano, if anyone is familiar with his work. So that's a, a fun thing. And there. I asked you the que uh, a similar question about doing a Percy Jackson basketball team. Yes. So, so hey, one of you is on the good. same wavelength same as wavelength. me already. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so everybody go check that out. But thank you all so much for coming. I really do appreciate it. And until we cross paths again, I'll have to find my way back to Austin. Until then, I'll see you later. Thanks so much for coming out, everybody. <laughs>
social media or reaching out to someone that you think would like the show or just leaving us a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you are using. All of those things help spreading the show's existence via word of mouth is essential for the podcast. So I'm very appreciative to anyone who has done that in the past or will do it in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode and I hope you tune into our next episode where we'll be continuing our coverage of the Sea of Monsters movie. But this time I will be joined by Michael Harley again and Kyle Banduho in San Antonio, Texas. But until then, I'll proceed you later. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, Ace Marmik. So while I was on tour, I was in the Denver airport and the Denver airport has one of those trains that goes in between the terminals and it plays some funky southwestern sounding music when it is letting you know that the next station is approaching and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed it. So I took an audio recording of what it sounds like and that will be this episode's ASMR Mac segment. Doors are closing. Please keep clear and hold on for departure to terminal, ground transportation and baggage claim. Thank you for listening.